I'm here with Dr. Amano to do SN1 and SN2 reactions. Hi, I'm Dr. Amano. I'd like to go over a nice question with you that I designed. I've been teaching organic chemistry here for 30 years, and I think you'll greatly, greatly be enhanced by this question that we're going to work on. Come on over, and I'm going to show you some great work. I want to show some questions, and the first question I think is one of the trickiest questions you'll ever see. Um, I gave you a secondary halide, and I gave you OH minus in water, and I want to know what kind of mechanism is it. There's no heat, so there's a chance we're not going to get that much elimination. So let's just assume we're going to get the substitution products. Now, what do we see here? I see a secondary halide and a strong nucleophile. Well, that favors SN2. The SN2 process is always favored by, an SN, by a strong nucleophile. On the other hand, the solvent is polar protic, and that would favor SN1. So in actuality, both could occur, an SN2 and an SN1. It would depend on the amount of concentration. If the concentration of nucleophile was high, say one molar, the nucleophile is high and it's strong. It turned out experimentally we got 96% SN2. If the concentration of the nucleophile was very diluted, then the mechanism would switch over and I got 98% SN1. So whenever you have a secondary halide, you got to be a little careful. There's always some competition between SN2, SN1. But a good general rule, if you see a secondary halide and the solvent is polar protic, you're going to think SN1. If it's a strong nucleophile, then it can sort of go either way. If you had a cyanide or a sulfur, those guys love to do SN2. But if you have water on a secondary halide, often we go SN1. Unless, as you can see in this example, a strong nucleophile was used in high concentration, it would favor the SN2. That's a really hard question and it's a very fine point. I'll be nice to you on the next two. We see cyanide and we have an alcohol as the solvent. This reaction would be slower. Why? The minute you see cyanide, you think SN2. SN2 is favored by polar aprotic solvents. This solvent is polar protic. Usually if it's polar protic, we do SN1, but not if the nucleophile is super strong, like a CN- is super strong. If you had methyl mercaptide, like a CH3S-, that would be very strong. Then it would favor the SN2, but it would be slower. So this would be a slower, but it's an SN2, so I'm hoping you can see this wedge or this dash becomes a wedge, and therefore we do the inversion, and we form the SN2 reaction. In the next example, we have a tertiary halide, and we have water. The minute you see a tertiary halide, you should be thinking SN1. Normally, tertiaries go in polar protic solvents because it's SN1. I just added a little tiny bit of acetonitrile, and that's what we call the co-solvent. That just helps it dissolve a little bit better. So mainly focus on the top one. That's the main solvent, which is going to be also the nucleophile. So what we're going to do is we're going to form the carbocation. We can attack it from the top or the bottom. We start with the molecule, that's S, and we end up with two products, two alcohols, one's an R and one's an S. Just check in the stereochemistry. This is one, this is two, this is three. Number four is in perfect position, so that would be an R. And then likewise, this is group number one, this is group two, this is three, this is four. Hope you can see that that's an S. Come around on the next board. I want to show you a very good challenge problem. Here's a problem I designed for you. This is for the student that really wants an advanced treatment. I gave you a molecule, and I say I treat it with NaH, and it's going to form an epoxide. But I want to know, is this starting compound, is it cis, or would it be trans? 
And that's what the squiggly mark means, that this could be either a dash or um, a wedge. The first thing you would do is, let's assume it's going to be going up, meaning it's a wedge. So if it was the cis isomer, so this being the cis isomer, my first step is the base would take off an H and you would get the O minus. Now, I'm going to redraw this. This means going up and this means going up. A wedge means going up. So I'm going to point this going up and this going up, which is the same as this. Now, the anti-bonding orbital is always at the rear. So as you can see, if this is the bonding orbital, this is the anti-bonding orbital here. Whenever we do a backside attack, we always hit the anti-bonding orbital, but it's got to be from the opposite side. I'm hoping you can see this is not a backside attack. The orbital is not correctly aligned. So therefore, this would not go. There is no backside attack here. It would actually be more towards the front side. So now let's try the other isomer. Let's try the trans isomer. Now, if I tried the trans isomer, these are going in opposite directions. You start it off the same way, the base pulls off the H, and you form an O minus. Now, the key thing is to redraw it. This means going down, this means up. So one's going down, one's going up, and at the rear is that anti-bonding orbital. And I'm hoping you can see I'm now in perfect alignment. This O minus is going to come in from the top, hit the anti-bonding orbital, and do the backside attack. So the orbital that I'm hitting is the sigma carbon to iodine star, anti-bonding orbital. And that would give the epoxide where the groups are going up. So the correct answer is the starting compound would be the trans. And don't forget if I ever ask you what's the relationship between a cis and a trans, they are diastereomers. Okay, I hope this helps and gives you a very good understanding of how I did what is known as an internal SN2 reaction. All right, that wraps this up. Go study, and if you got any questions, you can hit me up on Facebook. All right, bye-bye.